Good afternoon. I'm not talking to myself. Good afternoon. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to say thank everyone for being with us this afternoon and welcome to our inaugural Dart Martin Luther King celebration. My name is Teran McZee. I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion for Holland Public Schools. On the behalf of HPS, uh, our Board of Education, uh, and the City of Holland, we thank you for being with us this afternoon. As we prepare to celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., <clears throat> and if he was here today, he would turn 93 years old. I would like for us to recall and to remember his zest and his zeal for activism, engagement, and his call for a community to come together, to work together in what he called the beloved community. Now, <clears throat> the word beloved community was actually coined by a theologian named Royce, uh, Royce uh, Josiah. But Dr. King popularized the word beloved with the title of his book where he envisioned a nation of people, a community of people working across nationalities, creed, as well as race, amongst other things, doing so with mutual respect and harmony just for each other in general. That was an important aspect of his legacy for us all to remember as we continue to think about Dr. Martin Luther King. So again, I want to say thank you all for being with us this afternoon. I am privileged and I have the joy in introducing to you our mayor, Nathan Box, who's going to offer you the city welcome. Dr. Good afternoon. I'd like to first recognize some of our distinguished guests here today. Uh, and when I call your name, I'd ask you that you would uh, please stand so that you could be recognized by all of us here in person uh, and for those folks who are watching online. Uh, Doug Zylstra from our Ottawa County Board of Commissioners. Doug, I did see you here. Good to see you, Doug. Lynn Raymond from the Ottawa County City, or excuse me, City of Holland City Council. Belinda Coronado from Holland City Council. And I was told that Quincy Bird might be here as well, although I haven't seen Quincy. If he's here, please stand up, otherwise we miss you, Quincy. Uh, members of the Holland Public Schools Board of Education. And then Dr. Truss from Grand Valley State University. Thank you, welcome to all of you. And if there's anyone that I may have missed, my apologies. I've, I tried to scan as much as I possibly could. Sometimes it's hard without the masks. We'll make sure that we get you a special welcome when you come. People of Holland, I'm your mayor, Nathan Box. As the mayor at events like this, it's my job to provide a welcome from the city. And I do it often, and I enjoy it. Welcome. But for me, today is a little different and very special. And I'm going to ask that you just indulge me a bit. This event, this moment, for me has been 50 years in the making. It's the result of people that you've never met, engaging in actions that you've never heard of, all bringing me to this stage at this moment as the mayor of the people of the city of Holland to say welcome. So please, I ask you just to indulge me for a moment. As often as people complain about the internet, sometimes it can be a good thing. Twice last week, random internet searches revealed unexpected jewels. The first was the result of the search for an obituary for one of my clients. Yeah, I know that sounds a little bit weird, but in my day job, I'm an estate planning attorney, so that's one of the things that I have to do. Well, the search did not include my client's obituary, but near the top of the list was the obituary for my own father. You probably never knew him. You likely never heard of him. He died five and a half years ago. He was an educator, a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent of schools. 
As I reread his obituary, one line stood out. Bill taught his family many things, but most importantly, he taught us to care for others and look out for those who do not have anyone to watch over them. That, li that line encapsulates him and his life's work. In the last days before he died, he told me a story. He told a lot of stories. But this is one that I'd never heard before. As he lay in his hospital bed, he looked up at me and he said, I want to tell you about one of the proudest moments of my life. He had just been hired as a superintendent of schools. He was only about 40 years old. He hadn't officially started his new job yet. He hadn't even moved into the community. But he found out that there was a tradition in the community of a local group that included some prominent civic leaders holding a minstrel show in the school auditorium each year. Now, some of you may not know what a minstrel show is. Here's a definition. The minstrel show was an American form of racist entertainment developed in the early 19th century. Each show consisted of comic skits, variety acts, dancing, and music performances that depicted people specifically of African descent. The shows were performed by mostly white people in makeup or blackface for the purpose of playing the role of black people. Minstrel shows lampooned black people as dim-witted, lazy, buffoonish, superstitious, and happy-go-lucky. Holding a minstrel show in a school auditorium in western Michigan would be unheard of today. But this was 50 years ago. But still, during my lifetime. And it was tradition. Powerful people in the community not only went to the show, but performed in it. My dad immediately decided that there was no way that he was going to allow a minstrel show to occur in a school facility under his watch or ever again. Now remember, my dad had just been hired as the superintendent of schools. He hadn't even officially started the job. He was new to the community, hadn't even moved into it yet. He was risking his job, his family's livelihood, and his future. But he rallied the support of his new school board, other community members, stopped the show from happening, and prevented the minstrel shows from happening ever again. Upon reflection of a lifetime of achievement, of teaching, of success, on his deathbed, he counted this as one of the proudest moments of his life. He never lived to see his son become a mayor or to see the things that are being accomplished in our own community, but I think he'd be proud. Which brings me to the second internet epiphany I had last week. As it does, I'm sure with you, Facebook likes to remind me of what I was doing today. Last week, it reminded me that two years ago this week, the Holland City Council began investigating the possibility of creating a law that would provide comprehensive protection against discrimination in the city of Holland. And on August 20, 2020, after months of work, community engagement, deliberation, culminating in a marathon seven-hour city council meeting that ended in the wee hours of the morning, and 50 years after a young, newly hired superintendent of schools risked his job and his future to stop a minstrel show, his son, the mayor, in one of the proudest moments of my life, voted to send a strong, clear message to our community and to the world that discrimination on the basis of age, race, national origin, color, disability, education, familial status, sex, sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity, height, marital status, religion, source of income, or weight will not be tolerated in the city of Holland. It was, it was not only the right thing to do, it's good for all of us. Holland is a rich tapestry of people and cultures, and the diversity of the threads in the fabric not only make it stronger, but more beautiful. My dad knew that. He also knew that breaking down the barriers between us requires more of us than just opening a seat at the table. Anyone who's carried a lunch tray through a middle school cafeteria wondering where they can sit knows that an open seat is not necessarily an open invitation. My dad knew that each of us has special gifts. 
each of us has something to offer, but not everyone feels welcome to sit at the table and share their gifts. My dad taught us many things, but most importantly, he taught us to care for others and to look out for those who do not have anyone to watch over them. Looking out for others, welcoming them to the table, and sharing our gifts and our talents with one another makes us all better. So we must reach out to our neighbors and welcome them to the table. We must continue to send the message loudly and clearly. We celebrate the value of everyone who calls Holland home. That's the message that I bring you today. People of Holland, I'm your mayor, Nathan Box. It's my honor and privilege. It's my pleasure to welcome you. Welcome to Holland. Welcome to the table. We want you here. We need you here. Our success relies on each of you stepping up and giving your best, and in turn, welcoming others to the table as well. It's who we are, because this is Holland, one Holland. Our future is bright, and we get to live here. Thank you. Now I'm gonna give the floor to our superintendent, Nick Cassidy. Nick. Thank you. Um, superintendent, now for a month and a half or so, it seems longer than that, but it's, uh, but it's been going really well. Um, I was really excited to be asked to be part of this celebration today and excited to honor a man who showed us how much positive change can be made and inspired by one person. How one person's voice can be heard the world over. And but what I'm most excited about today when I heard about this program and about this event is that we have students whose voices will be heard today. And a kid who begins to recognize the power of their voice is one of the most beautiful and powerful things in this world. This day was designed as a day of service for building better communities while honoring the work of Dr. King. And we all know that there's still work to be done in this community and that work will not be finished by the adults in this room. It will be this next generation of leaders. So on this day of service, I'm excited that students from HPS are here to share their reflections of what Dr. King means to them and maybe start to realize that their voices are powerful and that they are the agents of change that we need. We have students right now in Holland Public that will change the world if given the chance. And as a community, I hope that we continue to invest in them to give them that opportunity. Thank you. So as our superintendent said, uh, <clears throat> we made sure we incorporated our students from kindergarten to 12th grade in this MLK event. With that being said, we have our first MLK speech winner. Um, student name is Savannah Martin. Do you mind coming up and giving us your speech? Savannah Martin, and this is my speech, my dream. Imagine this, people getting attacked by dogs and sprayed with water hoses, and little kids getting arrested. Now you all probably know of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not only was he a man who changed history by fighting for all races, but he was also a man who marched for all people to be equal. And I wish that I could tell him and my people and your people and all people that his dream came true, but I can't because there are still people who think that slavery was right. There are still people who think people of color shouldn't be or should be separated from white people. And there are still people who think all people of color shouldn't be equal. And I can't force those people to change, but what I can do is tell them my dream. My dream is for people to know that we are all human and people shouldn't get hurt 
are bullied, are made fun of just because of the color of our skin or for being mixed. Sometimes I even get mean looks and comments for being mixed. We are in the year 2022, not 1963. If I am still getting judged by the color of my skin in the year 2022, I am even more scared about my little brother. He's only four. Did you know a little black boy got shot just for playing with a toy gun? But all I can do is hope and wish and speak out to create a change in equality so that people will know what I know. I know we are all the same in the inside and the outside is what makes us unique and we need a change. On behalf of the City of Holland, I am pleased to introduce Joe Jones as our honored guest as we launch our first annual Martin Luther King Day of Celebration. Joe is the founder of the Hikima Group, a value-added consultancy whose primary mission is to provide sound wisdom and strategy to a myriad of industries. He is a servant leader with over two decades of experience leading teams and managing diverse organizations and individuals while using his lens of equity in the public and private sector. Joe is a seasoned leader who is passionate and strategic minded. He serves as a senior pastor at Brown Hutcherson Ministries in Grand Rapids and serves as the Grand Rapids City commissioner representing the second ward. He recently received a gubernatorial appointment to the board of, his, of trustees to his alma mater, Oakland University. Joe successfully led the Urban League of West Michigan, a historic civil rights organization for nearly 10 years in their efforts to develop and implement an agenda that promoted ec economic empowerment as a means of elevating the standard, living, standard of living in the underserved communities, urban communities of Grand Rapids and West Michigan. He is a much sought after board member and has served or currently serves on the boards of Mercantile, Mercantile Bank of Michigan, Axios Incorporated, Spectrum Health's Grand Rapids Community Board, the Economic Club of Grand Rapids, and Experience Grand Rapids. Joe holds a bachelor's degree in communication arts from Oakland University and a degree of master's in ministry leadership at the Grand Rapids Theological Seminary. He has also completed executive leadership programs at Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, Stanford University Graduate School of Business, and the NYU Stern School of Business. Joe and his beloved wife, Jessie, are the parents of four children and grandparents of five grandchildren. On behalf of our city, our students and faculty at Holland Public Schools, all of our community partners, virtual attendees, and our attendees here today, please extend a warm welcome to Joe Jones as our community's first annual Martin Luther King Day of Celebration speaker. Thank you so very much, my sister. I appreciate the uh, very kind introduction. And I want to begin by expressing my thanks this afternoon to firstly my dear friend and brother, uh, Taryn McZee of Holland Public Schools. Thank you so much for the invitation, for your consistent and impactful leadership in the DEI space. I know that Holland Public Schools is better because of your presence there. I'd also like to thank Holland Superintendent Nick Cassidy and the members of the Holland School Board, Holland Mayor Nathan Box, and my colleagues on the Holland City Council, and Ottawa County Deputy Administrator John Shea and the Ottawa County Board for your leadership here in Holland. But I have a special shout out for young sister Savannah Martin for your 
very encouraging and inspiring words on this afternoon. Thank you very much to you. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm more than honored to be here with you on this afternoon and celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I consider myself fortunate in that I am a graduate of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Senior High School in Detroit. And growing up in the D also meant celebrating Dr. King even as a child. We celebrated King well before it was recognized federal, uh, a recognized federal holiday in 1983. So it's fair to say that I have a long personal history of celebrating this royal figure, our King. But before I go any further, I must lay down the most important fact. Because by every great king is a, is a great queen. Barbara Reynolds, an author of My Life, My Love, My Legacy by Coretta Scott King stated, people are missing the fact that Coretta Scott King was a co-partner with Martin in the greatest and most successful human rights drive of our era. While she lived, she was most often referred to as a wife and after his death as a widow. But she was more than that. They functioned as a team. When the movement was getting started, she would give concerts to help fund the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. When the SCLC started in 1957, she presided and gave the first speech. When they were doing the Montgomery bus boycott, one night she was at the house with the baby and there was a thud and the front porch exploded. The next morning, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. came. And he was, very, he was a very impressive man. And he said he was taking her to Atlanta, that he wasn't going to let his grandchild get killed in Montgomery. She was only in her 20s. But she looked up at him and said, you don't understand. I may be married to Martin, but..." I'm also married to the movement. She had the courage to stay and lead and raise four children without fear. She knew this was history in the making. So as we celebrate the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. King, let us not forget the life, legacy, and sacrifice of his beloved teammate, Coretta Scott King. Beloved, my message on today is really about issuing a challenge to any and all who are listening. It matters not your age, your ethnicity, your gender, your zip code, your socioeconomic status. Because whoever and wherever you are, you are in a position to accept this challenge. I'm feeling a bit like the narrator for Mission Impossible where the familiar tagline was your mission, should you choose to accept it. But the difference is this message is not going to self-destruct in five seconds, no. This message, this invitation, this challenge is gonna sit out there for a while for you and others to consider. My challenge to you this afternoon is that I want to dare you to dream. I want to dare you to dream because anything is possible. I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of Americans, as well as pretty much everybody in this room, have heard or know about Reverend Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1963. It is his most famous, famous speech. Heck, I'd even be willing to state it's one of America's most famous speeches. Well, as we live through a global pandemic and political divisiveness, social unrest, and a plethora of inequities, I want to challenge each of us here to dare to dream. If ever there was a time to dream, it's right now. Did not the Reverend Dr. King challenge us on that fateful day in 1963 to do just that, to dream? 
You see, I draw my inspiration today not just from Reverend Dr. King, but also the Old Testament prophet Joel. In his time, there was a, a plague of locusts that had devastated the fields, threatening the people with starvation. There was a major crisis in the land. Bad things were happening. And so Joel gathers the attention of the people and God speaks. Over in Joel 2, it is written, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. You see, the prophet Joel lived where all of us live, in the past, in the present, and in the not yet. I swear, reading the prophetic words of Joel is as current as reading today's newspaper or listening to CNN, Brother, Brother Truss. The world in which Joel lived and spoke for God could be the world in which we live today. The reports and the pictures that fill our television screens each day report on the desperate plight of hundreds of thousands of people who have been crushed by a pandemic that seems to discover a new variant every week. The social unrest that reverberated throughout the world after the murder of George Floyd. The chilling visual of the insurrection of our nation's capital on January 6. There is suffering. There is mistrust. There is fear. There is anger. And I want to suggest there's not enough dreaming taking place. And if so, those dreams have become nightmares for some of us. But here's Joel in the, in the midst of this crisis. And what does he present? In the midst of calamity, he comes with a word. In the midst of great trouble, there is a word. When disaster strikes, there is a word. When it seems that all hope is gone, there is a word. You see, my brothers and my sisters, whatever your circumstances are now, whatever your fear, whatever the threat from those whom you see as your enemies, whatever the situation in your life, you got to dare to dream because anything is possible. You see, when we dream, lots of us dream dreams about what we wish, what we hope could be, what we wish for our children, our, our grandchildren, wish for ourselves, what we wish for our city, what we wish for our country. Sister Robin, well, I, I want to suggest that we examine those dreams that enter our minds and find out if maybe, just maybe, there's more to it. That's why we got to dare to dream. Another Old Testament legend, Joseph dared to dream. That's how it all started for him. Sometimes I ask myself, I say, self, why is it we don't dream? I mean, Reverend Dr. King dreamed even when the weight of the world was on his shoulders. And he lived a life in which the vast majority of the country hated him. And yet he still dared to dream. Why do we let excuses kill our dreams? Young Savannah mentioned earlier that she has a dream. Well, I've identified some dream killers that may sound familiar. How about this one? I'm too young. Well, I want to suggest there's no such thing. Now is the time. This Joseph that I spoke about, did you know that he was only 17 when he shared what his dream was? The Reverend Dr. King was only 26 years old when he was elected as president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, the organization that led the Montgomery bus boycott where approximately 40,000 black bus riders, the majority of the city's bus riders, boycotted the system. You're not too young. I just need you to dare to dream. 
Another dream, another dream killer is I'm too old. Never stop dreaming. Abraham, the father of many nations, was 100, and his wife Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. There's no such thing as, as too old. How about I'm too much of a failure? Says who? Failure is not fatal, and our miscues are not final. It's not about perfection, my brothers and sisters. It's about obedience. I'm too tired. I'm too insignificant. I'm too hampered by problems. I'm, I'm too hurt by others. Well, hurt is hard, but we must forgive. Don't let resentment ruin you. How about this last one? I'm, I'm too not where I thought I'd be. Well, if your life hasn't turned out how you thought it would, then you are right in line with a whole lot of us here in this room. Amen. You know, I learned some time ago that excuses are tools of nothingness which build bridges to nowhere. So no excuses, my brothers and sisters. We got to dare to dream. You see, I know we are busy people. We have a lot of distractions. Sometimes those thoughts, those dreams, they shrivel up and die like the seed that is sown in soil that experiences a drought. But poet Langston Hughes in his poem entitled Harlem, once asked the question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? I do believe sometimes dreams lie dormant for a while until a greater power source comes and causes them to sprout and grow and eventually bloom into a vision that is so powerful that it cannot be ignored. A vision that will drive you and me with energy toward a goal, a vision that will consume our lives. Sounds like Dr. King. A vision that will determine our thinking and put everything else into perspective. A vision that will set our priority. That sounds like Dr. King. A vision that will set in motion a series of events that took on a life of their own. You see, Abraham, whom I mentioned earlier, the father of many nations, had that kind of vision. It started him on a journey that began a people who followed God. Moses had that kind of vision. It was the vision that liberated the people from oppression and created the Hebrews into a nation. Joshua had that kind of vision. It took God's people into the land of promise. David, as young as he was, had that kind of vision. He defeated an army and saved a nation. Joel prophesied that our sons and daughters will prophesy, that old men will dream dreams, that young men will see visions. And so no matter whether you are a man or a woman, no matter what your color or your culture, no matter how rich or how poor you are in this world's goods, no matter how young or how old you are, you, every one of you, have a right to dream. Because anything is possible. Did you know that the Reverend Dr. King had no intention of being anything other than the pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia. When Rosa Parks was arrested for sitting in the first seat of the colored section of the bus and refusing to give her seat to a white man, she was arrested. She was taken to court, fined $10 and $4 court costs. The leaders of the black community came to King for help. King said that he was resistant to get involved. He, was, he had a young family. He was new to the community. He was a pastor of the church. He admitted that as he stood in the kitchen of their modest home, Brother McZee, he heard God calling his name as clearly as if God were standing in the room beside him saying, Martin, this is your opportunity. 
It was God's opportunity. It was God's time, God's person to show how inclusive God always has been and continues to be. You see, God's ancient and everlasting dream for all people became king's dream. And all of this would lead to death threats on his family's life, to him experiencing physical beatings, to him being jailed multiple times, and finally to him being assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. But civil rights legislation was passed in, in 1965. But of course, legislation does not change the hearts of people. Only God can do that, I want to suggest. You see, my daddy grew up in the segregated south of Montgomery, Alabama. Many of you here have family who also grew up in the segregated south. My daddy told me stories of what it was like. He knew something of how far we have all come. But until all people are seen as equal before God and seen as loved equally by God, we haven't arrived. So today we celebrate Dr. King's birthday with a national holiday. We have peaceful marches happening throughout the country, throughout the world. Community service taking place, celebrations, the reciting of the I Have a Dream speech. And I hope with remembering the price that has been paid not only by Dr. King, but by many others as well. But sitting in every one of these chairs here on this afternoon are people who are holding dreams and visions in your minds and your hearts. Maybe you think the dreams or visions you have are impossible. Big dreams and big visions often seem that way. But if the vision is so small, and so, so insignificant that one could accomplish it in one's own strength, we would not feel the need to depend upon one another for its realization. But that vision often starts with the dream. That's why we gotta dare to dream. You see, at least once a year, I go and I visit the doctor to have my jacked up vision checked. The doctor checks my ability to see at a distance. They check my peripheral vision to find out how far to the right or to the left I can see while I remain focused straight ahead. They check how much pressure there is within my eye that might cause my vision to be distorted. And peep this, when all the tests are finished, they know whether or not my vision needs to be corrected, or if the pressure needs to be altered. I want to suggest on this afternoon that every so often, my brothers and sisters, we need a checkup on our moral and spiritual vision. We need to find out if we're seeing clearly that which has been placed at some distance in front of us. Every so often, we need a checkup on our moral and spiritual vision to find out if we can see the big picture rather than having tunnel vision. Every so often, we need to have a checkup on our moral and spiritual vision to find out where the pressures are coming from in our lives that would damage our focus and blur our vision. So let me ask you this afternoon, how's your vision? And while I'm asking you that, let me ask you whether you're allowing yourself to dream. Dreams happen when we let our imagination run wild, when we choose to think outside the box, when we throw off all of the constraints of the way things are and imagine the way things could be. Author Edward Lindemann said it helps to realize that everything that is now possible was at one time impossible. In every case, someone, somewhere, dared to dream, dared to imagine something a little better, a little different. So what is a dream? I want to suggest a dream is God's picture, vision, or blueprint for a preferred future that helps you fulfill your purpose 
in life. And as I've stated earlier, you're never too young or too old to pursue and achieve your dreams. We need to dare to dream because Dr. King reminded us in his message entitled, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution, that all mankind is tied together, all life is interrelated, and we are all caught in an escapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality, King said. You see, we need to dare to dream because in order for us to get to a better place, a, a place of equity, a place of justice, a place of peace, we need to be working to uproot, which means we need to be willing to get our hands dirty. He warned us in that same speech, let nobody give you the impression that the problem of racial injustice will work itself out. Let nobody give you the impression that only time will solve the problem. That is a myth. And it is a myth because time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. In the final analysis, racial injustice must be uprooted from American society because it is morally wrong, said King. You see, my brothers and sisters, we need to dare to dream because I believe we can collectively live out his dream. We must be givers. We must be doers. In this same speech, he was speaking to a graduating class of Oberlin College, and he said, I urge you to continue the tradition that you have followed so long, for this institution has probably done more than any other to support the struggle for racial justice. You have given your time, you have given your earnings, you have given your bodies, you have participated in demonstrations. You have participated in the determined struggle to keep this issue in the forefront of the conscience of the nation. I urge you to continue to do so as you go out into your various fields of endeavor. Never allow it to be said that you are silent onlookers, detached spectators, but that you are involved participants in the struggle to make justice a reality. Let me close with this. My ancestor, as well as Reverend Dr. King's ancestor, Harriet Tubman, said, every great dream begins with a dreamer. So, brothers and sisters, just like Reverend Dr. King, dare to dream. And when it seems like all hope is gone, you keep dreaming, and you keep working, and you keep serving, and you keep giving, and you keep believing that anything is possible. Don't let anyone or anything stop you from dreaming. Not age, not circumstance, not doubters, not haters, not naysayers, not violence, not anything. Like Langston Hughes declared in his poem entitled Dreams, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast, my brothers and sisters. Hold fast to your dream. God bless you. I don't know how to follow that, <clears throat> but great job, Joe. Thank you so much for the words. Now we're going to have our middle school uh, MLK speech winner. Whew, let me get this name right. Layla Sudorarajan. <laughs> As we come to mark the 59th anniversary 
of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I Have a Dream speech, we must remember all that he did for our country. 54 years ago, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. died because of his beliefs. He believed so strongly that our nation would one day, one day join hands and not judge by skin color, but by the character of the person. It is our job to follow in his footsteps and go the distance he did to make peace among everyone, black or white. We look back to August 28, 1963. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the sad news of freedom for the black still being diminished by the shadow of power the white men had. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at a table of brotherhood, spoke Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he delivered the ever famous I have a dream speech. Now as we look at society today and realize that most people can't trace their family tree back to slaves and slaveholders. I know that it would be really hard for me to trace my family tree back to that time and it would be for most people my age. Over time we haven't learned much about our past and I think that it is sad that society today mostly looks at the present and the future. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well I think it is both good and bad. Why is it good? This is good because right now, anyone could be living up to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. You could be sitting right now with former slave owners' children or the former slave slaves' children. Then why is this a bad thing? This is a bad thing because we are dishonoring our past and ignoring it. If we were to go in time and look at the future 100 years from now, wouldn't you want to be remembered? We know that this is a significant time in history, and I certainly think that we should all be remembered by at least our family. It takes a great amount of courage to speak against the wrong and do what is right. What do we know about our family and what they did? It is also a bad thing because we may not be living up to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech or dream. So what do we need to challenge ourselves with as we come up on Martin Luther King Jr. Day? We need to challenge ourselves to not judge people by looks when we first meet them. Now you don't have to say anything aloud, but think if you have ever done this. Let's say that you were in a hotel and you got in an elevator. You stop on the way up to your floor and a black person gets in. Most people would get nervous and maybe move away a little or hold on to tighter to any belongings they have. Is that you or do you know someone like that? If, you, if we were to solve this problem and automatically not judge people at first sight, think of the difference it would make in society. Maybe we wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't have a wage gap among people working. Maybe everyone would be given a chance at getting a job that suits their interests and needs. Maybe people would all be looked at the same way when they are first met. Maybe we would see more diversity in heavily white populated areas. Maybe people wouldn't joke about racism as much, and maybe this would start a domino effect that would get, of, get rid of looking down upon gay and trans people, women, and people with a poor history. These are all maybes, and it is up to us to make these maybes true. After all, aren't we all equal? Good afternoon, everyone. We are announcing the MLK Community Services Award. The MLK Service Award seeks to recognize an individual who has removed barrier, barriers toward the advancement of black, indigenous, and people of color in the Holland area. This person has a heart and passion for serving members of the Holland community by connecting people and or organizations. They have a vision for a more inclusive and just community and is a strategic thinker evidenced through taking a thought or idea and moving it into actionable steps or impact. The individual selected as the first recipient of this award moved to the Holland area in 1968 to attend Hope College. This community then became their second home they taught at Washington Elementary School of the Holland Public Schools for 32 years. For the first 28 years, they were the first and only black educator. This individual has been recognized with numerous awards, including 
1986 Excellence in Education Award for the City of Holland, 1988 Non-Hispanic Educator of the Year for the State of Michigan, the City of Holland's Human Relations Aware for Dedication and Appreciation from 1982 to 1988, and the Hope College Upward Bond Award for 30 years of dedicated and continuous service. This individual also has spent many years giving back to the City of Holland um, in various capacities as listed. Chairperson, Human Relations Commission for the City of Holland, member of the Holland Police Advisory Board, chairperson for the Holland Public Schools Mentor Program for Teacher. It is my esteemed desire and excitement, one second, to present someone that I am uh, um, proud to know has always supported me in my work here in the city of Holland. Um, this award goes to um, someone that has been just um, a great person in this community. I'm pleased to announce the recipient of this year's award goes to Mr. Marvin Robert Younger. <laughs> Unfortunately, my friend Marvin has decided to spend the cold winter months and some were extremely warm. So he's not physically here with us, but if I can point your way to the screen, he left us a warm message. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry that I cannot be there with you in person, but considering the delays at the airport it was really impossible for me to get there. I learned at the feet of my mother, who was a deaconess in the church, that love and the care for others was extremely important. In fact, I don't think my mother ever met anyone that she didn't love immediately. She was the mother for the entire neighborhood. She was that stereotype. And she taught that to all 10 of her children. So when I came to Holland, it was ingrained in me to do whatever I could to make this world a better place. In doing so, I served on a number of committees and task force to make a change, to make a difference. I thank you this evening for this honor. I'm sorry I'm not there with you, but I wish all of you well, and I hope that you take this evening and think about the children going to school, to school and all of the trauma that they are going through. They're going to need help and the teachers are going to need help. As a teacher for many years, I speak from experience. Also, my thoughts go out to all of the seniors in our neighborhoods that are alone especially during the winter, and not able to get out because of the corona situation. Adopt someone on your street. Make an effort to call them, to talk to them, so that they don't feel alone. Have a great evening. God bless you all, and thank you. I am deeply honored. So we'll have our final MLK speech winner, which is our high school winner. I'm gonna ask these names. I love them. Raneem Shamaya. Did I say that? Did I say it right? I think I said it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> 
2011, the war started in my home country, Syria, and it's still happening today. Because of this, there was a lot of hunger, homelessness, and many refugees. The war separated families. It made me, me and my family away from people we love and made us run away from war, from one country to another. Everyone must understand the consequence of war. Today, everyone must take the world a better place like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did and continue his work so the war will case. In honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I want to use this moment to talk about the civil rights activist who had a great influence on United States society in 1950s. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made the world a better place by leading a civil rights movement that focused on nonviolent protests. Because of his vision in equality and civil disputes, the world are sh improved for many African Americans in his time and for many decades after. One of his great achievements was I Have a Dream speech that was delivered on August 28, 1963. During the March on Washington, it called for freedom and equality. It was the most iconic speech in the history of the United States. More than 2,500 people gathered at Lincoln Memorial in, in Washington, D.C. We all should continue his work by being kind to one another. Being kind doesn't have to be big. It can be sm small and easy, like smiling and giving respect like how we want to be treated. My dream, to stop war. War kills create 7% of hunger all around the world and tears people away from people they love in Syria, Yemen, and Mexico. It happened to me and to my family. I don't want it to happen to anyone else. I don't want anyone to experience this because it's not easy. My dream is that no one goes hungry. No one is torn from their loved ones and everyone in the world live in a peace. Special thanks to Superintendent Cassidy for helping me with those names. <laughs> Appreciate you. <laughs> um, so in closing, we've heard some powerful speeches from all of our participants in this program. In closing, I'd like to thank a couple people, organizations, and companies for their help in organizing this event. So to the City of Holland, thank you for being open to this. This is awesome. Thank you. Uh, to Gentex Corporation, thank you. Where, Gentex, raise your hand. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sponsoring the lunch for us. Uh, although my partner in crime, Mike Gorehouse, couldn't be with us today, I know Johanna is here, but the Community Foundation for Holland and Zealand, thank you so much as well. Uh, Escape Ministry, Jenny Jones and Escape Ministry, thank you so much as well. Let's see. Um, I am Academy, uh, Cherry and um, Cherries, thank you so much. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, the Civic Center and their staff. Where's Sarah? Sarah, thank you so much. For, appreciate every, all the work you all done. Ben, thank you as well, Ben. Also, I want to get a special thanks to the committee who actually helped make this thought of mine a reality. Uh, again, partner Mike Gorehouse, thank you. Uh, Esther, could you stand, Esther? Uh, <clears throat> Johanna, could you stand? Jennifer, can you stand, please? Uh, Lindsay, can you stand as well? And last but not least, uh, Brother Matthews, Joe Matthews. I want to say, listen, we did a lot of arguing in the war room, but we got it together, and we're here today. So I want to tell all of them thank you so much for helping uh, put this event together. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not um, say thank you to a couple people in our district. Um, to my CEI committee. So my CEI is my chairs for equity and inclusion. We have a chair in equity and inclusion person at each school. We have a DEI person at each one of the schools in Highland Public School District. Could you all stand real quick? So Chair of Caitlin, Jason, Karen, Richard, and Beth, thank you all so much. They were the ones that was actually put all of this uh, MLK speech program together for our students and got all our winners together. So again, thank you to you all um, as well. But I want to give a special, special thanks to uh, a person 
Um, I know you all got a chance to see the beautiful art that was done out there by our kindergarten through third grade. But Julie, where's Julie? Julie, thank you so much. She put all that together with our students. So thank you, Julie. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> I'll leave you with this, some words from Dr. Martin Luther King. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other effectively. Dr. Martin Luther King, thank you all for being here. I appreciate you all. Safe travels. There's, there's still food? Is it gone, Sarah? Okay, I, hey, it's paid for. So I figure, you know, we, we eat still. So, but thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs>